So we've heard a lot of extraordinary claims from a lot of people at this festival, and they're fairly common. And one of the, we've, we've chatted with a bunch of our students about some of the extraordinary claims that they've experienced, and I'm sure people at home have had some similar experiences. One of the ones that I remember, uh, it was a student who said that uh, she was walking through a shopping mall, and it just so happened that this was the anniversary of her grandmother's death. While she's walking through the shopping mall, over the loudspeakers, there's music playing. But midway through a song, it cuts out and it shifts to her grandmother's favorite song. Yeah, another common one was premonitions. So dreaming about something and then it coming true. And this isn't innocuous stuff like dreaming about an apple and then seeing an apple the next day. These are really specific things that they're remembering. So dreaming about a, a crow jumping from tree to tree and then seeing it the next week. Yeah. Or dreaming about an old friend and having them appear on your doorstep the next day. That's right. And this is our job here, is, is to figure out why people believe weird things. And not, you know, it's not enough just to say, as we said before, that um, people like to believe in weird things or they take comfort in the paranormal or, you know, that doesn't really explain anything. Instead, what we're trying to do is to focus on the cognitive mechanisms, to focus on explanations in terms of perception, attention, memory. Uh, and one of these things that we're going to be dealing with is, is ambiguity which is really important. We've touched on it a few times in the course. Um, we, last episode, we talked about the Necker Cube, uh, the spinning dancer and a bunch of different things, bistable illusions. This is a really nice example. The figure here, the letter B, the, or the number 13, is ambiguous. In the context of A and C, it looks like a B. In the context of 12 and 14, it looks like a 13. And again, this is two different ways that you can interpret this event. Um, Another example was by Tom Gilovich. He provides uh, a smiling person. Now, this smiling person can either be interpreted as uh, being friendly, it's, an, it's a genuine smile, if you like the person. Uh, if you don't like the person, you might interpret it as a smirk, as being um, malicious somehow, or you know, they're up to something. But it's exactly the same smile being interpreted in two different ways, which is a little bit more realistic. Yep, so that's ambiguous information. I think there's a second factor going on called multifaceted expectations. So yes, with the ABC and the, and the 12, 13, 14, there are really only two ways of seeing it. Just like the sp spinning ballerina, it spins left or it, it spins right. The Necker cube pops out or comes back in. They're, they're two dimensions, they're, they're two ways of seeing it. Yeah. But much of the objects that we deal with and uh, the events that happen in our everyday lives are not two dimensional. They're not even three dimensional, they're multi dimensional they're multifaceted so in one episode we talked about talent and there's several different ways that can be viewed we talked about something as innocuous as a job interview and how many different ways that can be viewed so dealing with that that complexity and ambiguity that there there are so many ways that these things can be viewed that's when it when our our pattern recognizers really kick in. We really see what we expect to see when we have multi-dimensions. That's right, and the two can operate together. You can have ambiguity and these multifaceted expectations working in conjunction. And one really nice example of this was when we visited the horoscope booth at uh, the Mind Body Spirit Festival. Now they prepared these uh, these personalized portraits that, on the basis of where the planets are and how they're interacting in the sky. And these portraits that they create are anything but personalized, right? And they're extremely multifaceted and extremely ambiguous. So one of the examples that they provide was uh, this, from the sign of Venus. Now it says, a beautiful mind and a mind for beauty. So they are somebody who has a beautiful mind and mind for beauty. Mm -hmm. um, and you can read here when it comes to, I think it. When it comes to personal relationships, you tend to be rather idealistic. You seek a lover who is both intelligent and good looking. That's because it's in Libra. In the fourth house, you're also going to have has something to do with your home. Your home is also going to be that way as well. So Venus is very is very uh, important in the person in this this person's home life. Their house has to be beautiful. Whereas if it was in the first house, they themselves would be quite beautiful. They would be very. Uh, focus on their own appearance. Mm -hmm. Whereas here, this person here, because of the position in the sky, their home is, is where they focus their sense of beauty on, or where they, their sense of style. And because it's in Libra, they probably have a very good sense of style because that's, that's a Libra thing. 
Now these portraits that they've put together are really anything but personalized. They would really apply to anybody. I mean, what do you mean by idealistic or uh, good looking or charming? I mean, these are very sort of general statements. And as Richard Wiseman said, uh, these are called Barnum statements, or the Barnum effect is the fact that there's something for everybody, uh, that there's an enormous amount of overlap between your own characteristics and these sorts of statements, and anybody who's reading them would be able to find something of themselves in them. And they're often very flattering as well to say that you have untapped potential or that you're an independent thinker, right? I mean, who doesn't want to think that about themselves? Yep, another factor that's operating, I think, is multiple endpoints. Now, we need to think about this when we're trying to assess the validity of these claims. And you, the analogy is casting a wide net, catching a big fish in that wide net, and then claiming that you caught it with a spear, right? Yep. And this is very common in psychic predictions. So a psychic may say something like, oh, I see an older gentleman in your family is having heart problems. I see some pain around the chest and there's a weight there. Yep. Now. What can that mean? Again, it's multifaceted. So what's the older gentleman? It could be my older brother, my, uh, my father, my grandfather. It can happen across that dimension. And it can also happen in time. So what kind of heart problem are we talking about? Uh, a death? Is it a diagnosis? Is it a prediction that's going to happen? And what is a heart problem? So does an angina count? Uh, does uh, forgetting your heart medication on that particular day, coming back from the doctor with a diagnosis of high blood pressure, does that count? Mm -hmm. And let's not forget about just the base rates. That is uh, just the probability of you having anyone in your entire family with any sort of heart issue whatsoever is really likely. I mean, I, just thinking of my own family, I can think of about a dozen people in my family or extended family that, you, that might count as part of that, right? But I. I think one of my favorite examples of this was uh, in your conversation with the chiropractor at the Mind Body Festival. Uh, and in that, in that conversation, he rattled off at least a dozen possible symptoms that you might have as an indication that you might need some chiropractic treatment. As your spine comes up, all of you tends to lean in that direction. Now, if your spine was lovely and straight, your head would be sitting over here. Obviously, it's not. So it would suggest that your spine comes up as a little bit of an S shape and might trigger another weak area here. It can present as, of, as either neck pain, shoulder pain or headaches. And of course the nerves in that part of the spine deal with cardiovascular function. So low energy, trouble sleeping, snoring, shortness of breath, hay fever, asthma, allergies, blood pressure issues, chest pains, angina, functional heart problems, dead. You know, those sorts of things may be symptoms. Gotcha. None of those. No. Not Good. sure about death. Good job. Hopefully not there. Yeah. 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 But just because they're weak areas doesn't always mean they present as symptoms. Now he just rattled off a whole bunch of different symptoms. Everything from uh, trouble sleeping to lower back pain to death. But I think most people when listening to this set of symptoms who are considering the possibility of chiropractic treatment would be able to find something in their own experience to kind of cling on to. So he cast a really wide net. And so I suspect that he'd catch somebody within that net if, if, if it's cast wide enough. And I think if you combine these multiple endpoints with um, ambiguous statements, like we talked about before, uh, then that's nicely captured in the Japanese healing booth that we visited as well. Now, they made some really kind of ambiguous statements about uh, the, the effects of their treatment. For example, improved well-being or increased happiness or um, strengthening the immune system. I mean, what do these even look like? If you were to, if you were to test whether somebody's well-being was improved, I mean, what would that actually look like? It's, it's a really broad characterization. Yep, and think about another dimension that's operating in time. So we've got multiple windows of time that are happening here. Yep. So if, uh, if a prediction is made, when do you stop looking for hits? If a healer says they've healed you or they've treated you, when should you stop looking uh, when should you expect to feel better? Yep. When should you stop looking to feel better and say, well, that healing mustn't have worked? Now, Tom Gilovich has spoken about this previously. It's a common belief that things happen in threes. So homicides, natural disasters, these things occur in triplets, right? But when do you stop counting it as a triplet? When right? you get to three. Yeah, exactly, right? So if you, if you allow for enough variability in these windows of time, these predictions can only be 
confirmed. It's yeah. very difficult to disconfirm. That's right. And a, a nice example of this <laughs> is, is quite a personal one, actually. I was talking to my mom on the phone in preparing for this course uh, and preparing for this segment in particular and telling her about uh, going to the Mind, Body, Spirit exhibition and so on and talking to tarot card readers. And she said, I went to a tarot card reader once about uh, 30 years ago, I guess. 30 years? Yeah, it was about nine or ten years old. And she went to this tarot card reader and it kind of freaked her out actually a little bit because the, the, the reader said that she would be in a large fire, right? She'd be okay, but the rest of her family might not be. And so from that point on, she actually lost sleep in thinking about this and in dwelling on, uh, on what she said during the reading. And, you know, I mean, if, if you kind of fast forward, she still remembers that reading 30 years later. And so you can imagine if there was a fire uh, a decade later or something, she would probably be very likely to attribute it as a success on behalf of that particular reader. Yeah. Or if it, if it was just a fire down the street or your next door neighbor or a exactly. brush fire, all of these things would probably count. So there's enough variability in, the, in, the, in what counts as a fire, in the time that it takes. It could be 30 years on and you could still count it as, count it as a hit on, on, on that part. So that really freaked her out when she had this reading and, and there was the possibility that her family was going to burn in a fire, right? I mean, that's, that's kind of scary. And when you're thinking about whether to count the prediction as a success or not, uh, there's a whole bunch of things that can vary in terms of uh, the nature of the fire, right? We, we actually, a few years later, had our, our Christmas tree burned down uh, due to my remote control car. Does that count? Is that a fire? I mean, it could be a brush fire. It could be uh, a fire at our neighbor's place. That's close enough. I mean, or uh, when? Obviously, it's 30 years later, and she still thinks about that particular reading. And if there was something 30 years on, she, would, she still might be able to make that link. So I think these things, uh, variable windows in time, multiple endpoints, I think are really important. Yeah, so we've gone through a few of these general mechanisms that are sort of operating in, in paranormal phenomena and predictions such as these. And we've got a couple more to get through, but let's ask people a few questions before we move on to make sure they really grasp what's going on here. Mm -hmm.